welcome, Sophie. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's um, such a joy to see you. I, I love it when these things work out and we can see each other and it all kind of fell into place. It's always just, I don't know, you feel like the universe works. It's great. Sometimes it does. Who knew, you know? <laughs> Where are you? Are you in the UK now? I am. I am. I'm, I'm in my sitting room, which is the quiet room. You will notice there are no children in this room um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's 7 p.m. here. So... I have to say this podcast has been the best thing ever because I've had children like for the last hour. You know what it's like, kind of we've been doing homework and piano and eat and trumpet practice and 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 oh I've got a cut and oh this thing. and then at seven I was like, I have to go now and do this like really important podcast. I'm really, really sorry about that, you know, what a shame. So, you know, just see you later. And, <laughs> can we do this every night? This would be great. I would I, love that excuse too. I have to go and have a really essential chat right now. So sorry to miss out on like the whole bedtime chaos. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's tear inducing. It's true. But, you know, sometimes we just have to soldier on through. It's just, we you do, know. We do. <laughs> so I'm very happy here. <laughs> yes, good. I'm so glad. Yes, I've left the uh, Zoom school situation in the next room because we're still during the day, obviously. So that's um, also really fun. <laughs> No, we are back at, at, at bricks and mortar school. So we are not in that anymore. That is quite the challenge. It's just the afternoons. They go in the mornings and then they come back and then there's more in the afternoons. But of course it's on the iPad. So they're like, well, let's just play with something fun on the iPad. And I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm obviously super motivated like we all are in the afternoon. Yes, We're all exactly. so energetic after lunch, aren't we? Work is exactly what we want to do right totally. there. Of course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's nice. That's all great. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> anyway, now that, uh, you know, bedtime and Spanish are going on in separate rooms, we can have our adult conversation, <laughs> which is great. I have been reading your books since I feel like you started writing them. And I feel like I've like grown older as you've grown older and all these things, all these major life events, your characters have gone through in the Shopaholic series and all the rest. Like it's just been great. And now to be talking to you about it, it's just like the perfect, you know, ending to this Oh, journey well, through your books. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, I mean, I love meeting someone who has read my words and enjoyed them and perhaps they've made, you know, made you smile or whatever. So this is a real treat for me because, I mean, as you can imagine, authors, we kind of, we're on our own most of the time and we send out our words and we just hope it's like this act of faith. Like, I hope somebody likes it. I hope somebody, you know, is like whipping over the pages or they smile or they laugh. So this is really quite a treat for me. Just to hear and that. I feel like someone like you who's had so much success in the literary world and bestseller after bestseller, like wouldn't need that validation or wouldn't even appreciate it anymore. Oh no, it's the opposite. Um, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, what, however long you've been doing it, you start to think, well, you know, do people still like what I do and, and, and come, how, how could I put that to the test? And I think especially this year when I haven't been out and about, um, you know, it's just really important to connect in every sense as humans, you know, as family members and, and as an author with your readers. Um, we've all missed out on so much connection this year that I think we're all craving, you know, interaction of all different kinds. So for me that, you know, it's, it's lovely, you know, hi, reader. <laughs> <laughs> this is so nice. I feel a bit starved of contact. <laughs> I might get quite needy in a minute. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm wondering if I'll be able to actually close this laptop or if you're going to be in there every time I open it. <laughs> yes, I, I will. You knew it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my gosh, so funny. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about your latest book. Tell listeners what it's about, what inspired you to write it, this hilarious writing retreat that you have your main character go on, which is just so funny um, with your characteristic sense of humor. I think that's part of why I was so excited to talk to you because I'm just like, this is completely like what I find funny is what you find funny. You know, you don't oh, always, you know. You do wonder, you think, oh no, is this just me? Is this like oh. really embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> well, really kind of looking at the difference I suppose between like you know instinct and practicalities of love so my my heroine is super romantic and we all go through like a journey with a loved one we meet them and we kind of take in details about them or maybe these days we've met them online and I think this is what makes it really interesting so you build up a picture 
Um, and we kind of fantasize, don't we? We fill in the gaps. So you, 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 you maybe you text them or you go on that first date and you've got so many good impressions, but you don't quite know the rest of it and you kind of fill in the gaps. And then gradually you get to know the real deal. And for most people, this is quite a sort of slow process. You're taking in information. You're thinking, OK, does this person match up to what I originally imagined? And you have kind of reality checks. OK, so I thought, well, what's the kind of most extreme version of the kind of reality check so i set up this heroine who is a deluded romantic and she just believes in instinct and then it happens that she's at this writing retreat where nobody uses their name nobody gives out any personal details and i have to say this was slightly inspired by i have a friend who went on a yoga retreat and nobody said a word all week so you're just taking in impressions of people and she falls in love with this guy. She doesn't know what his name is or his job or anything about him except kind of how he looks, his demeanor, what he says about writing, but nothing else. They don't divulge any details. And she falls in love and takes it to the max. I mean, they kind of commit to each other. They pledge to each other. It's like your most extreme version of your holiday romance. And then, boom, come home reality and it's like the most extreme version of wait what wait wait this is not what i imagined what this is how you live this is your job she's imagined that he's like an artisan carpenter based on very little evidence but she's just got it in her head that this is who he is this is what you know she's got the idea that he has a particular name and none of this is the case and so then she's faced with okay so this is the guy in my head this is what I'm presented with in real life. He, by the way, is exactly the same. He had all kinds of ideas what she might be like. And um, they get to the end. Oh, wait, I lost you for a sec. You said they get to the end. Wait, go back. Hold on, it's frozen for a second. Helps these. Wait, 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 go back to, she comes to the end because it froze out for a second. You go and she comes to the end. She comes to the end, he gets to the airport and reality is there and they both get met by she gets met by her crazy dog and her crazy friends and he gets met by mr corporate driver and they look at each other in absolute shock like wait who are you you know i love you but i have no idea who you are and now i'm gonna have to find out um, and part of the inspiration was that saying that you you know you read and, and it's around the place love me love my dog there's a dog in this book. And I thought, well, I'm going to extend this to love me, love my life, because they get to know each other's lives from the dog to the friends, to weird habits, to things which seem small, but are actually become quite a sort of, you know, like there's a moment where he runs her a bath and he says, I'll run you a lovely warm bath. Oh, it stopped again. Wait, you have to come back. I wonder if this is what are you talking about? And he's okay, like, I lost it. It's paused again for a second. I don't know what's going on, but you said, um, go from when you said, I'm sorry to make you redo this. You said something about, I'll love you, I'll draw you a lovely warm bath, and then keep going. So he draws her a bath. This is going to be the kind of healing moment, and she gets in. And she's like, what is this? This is not a warm bath. This is tepid. I'm freezing. And he's staring at her in utter incomprehension. Like, this is a really warm bath. And it just kind of signifies how they're on completely different pages. They better get used to this. And I suppose the book explores what do you get used to? What can you put up with? At the beginning of the book, she is adamant. She is not a deal breakers kind of a person. She doesn't believe in them. She thinks they're the work of the devil. She kind of lectures her friends who are a bit more pragmatic and dating online and having to create profiles. And she's like, I, I can't engage with this. I could just love any man. I have no, no parameters. I'd never have a deal breaker. And then she's looking at this guy thinking, okay, I don't like this, I don't like that, I can't relate to this, your family has these weird customs. And so the question throughout the book is, what can they get used to? What can they not get used to? What could change? How could they compromise? And hopefully finding the comedy in all of it, because that's what I like to do. I like to kind of slightly torture my characters. 
<laughs> really terrible, embarrassing, cringy moments at all times. And, and they certainly do go through a few of those. Wait, why do you like to do that to your characters? Because by the way, then your reader is like similarly like cringing and like holding their breath and covering their face as well. Like, what is that about? Why do you like to do that? You know, I just, that's, I just find it so entertaining and I love to laugh and I love to push it. What I feel is just enough to make you laugh and go, oh, no way. And also kind of be obsessed by turning the page to see how are you going to get out of this? Um, and hopefully not take it so extreme that it's painful. Although I do think that sometimes I, 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 <laughs> I do torture my readers as well. Um, I just can't help seeing like the potential for the extreme version like everybody doesn't get on with some aspect of their partner's life. And I just thought, well, I'm going to just take this to the max, you know? Um, so her flat, her, he can't get on with her furniture. I mean, you know, so many things about their life, but at the same time, I do feel like comedy has to come out of reality. So there kind of an, is a, a real kind of contemporary thread to all this and I read an awful lot online about kind of online dating and what are people's real deal breakers and how do they go about this um, and you know it does cause pain as well as comedy and it does cause you know some thoughtful processes going on and some development and and kind of their characters have to go somewhere in the light of all this so hopefully it's kind of there's a mix of there's comedy but there's real stuff and and i hope there's love in this book too you know yeah, it's got love. Great. i love how you set it up in the beginning when when her roommates are online and she's like how can you do that like how can you search 10 miles from where you live what if he lives 11 miles away and they're like no no no, it's fine he'll lie about that part but she's like <laughs> horrified you know because it's true like what if you just and that i think it like speaks to this whole crazy falling in love thing in general which seems completely random what if you just missed by your parameters, the guy of your dreams? Like, what if you just walked out of the restaurant before he walked in? Like, what if you never met? Like, and if it's your fault, right? It's like this whole, like, nothing really makes sense. So you have to just roll with it. Anyway. <laughs> I completely agree. And I think that we have a kind of an added pressure on us when we have to create a profile and define it in advance because sometimes you don't know what you're looking for I mean it's a bit like shopping and one of my characters does actually liken it to choosing a white shirt on a website that has so many white shirts you're bewildered and then and actually I was slightly inspired I created a fictitious website with a million filters and I was slightly inspired by shopping websites where in order to make any sense of it at all you just have to filter you know, okay, this size, this kind of collar, this sleeve length, well, you know, apply that to a life partner. Um, but, but then you start to think, but even with, even with clothes, you think, wait, I don't really know. I mean, what if I saw a great shirt and it did have a longer sleeve, but I loved it. I'm stressed <laughs> out now. I'm stressed. What do I want? But I can't see a thousand shirts. And then you add that, you put that to a man. I, I mean, I don't know, do I, you know, does the hair color? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, once you start looking at it, it's, it is quite funny, but it is also quite painful if, if this is what you're having to do. And as you say, it's so arbitrary. Yes. So mm -hmm. arbitrary. Yeah. And then because what it really comes down to is that it's completely out of your control. And I think that's what all the filters are designed to, you know, fool you into believing that you have some control over your search when really it's like completely random and out of your control. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you, how did you come up? So I know you came up with this, but you've been like consistently sort of innovating and coming up with new ideas and taking your character through all these times. Like, tell me about how you decide what books you're going to write, like what you're doing with your characters. Like, does it always come from life? Just like, how is it, how has the progression of your characters evolved? Oh, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I think that each book has a slightly different genesis. So sometimes I'll start with a character. So like with the Shopaholic series, it was very much, I can see this character and now I want to put her in different situations. Um, sometimes um, stuff just happens in life. I kind of, I, I, I kind of, I'm aware of what we're all talking about. Like 
you know, with this kind of social media, that, that became an interest to me because I was just, we're all talking about this. So I tend to sort of plug into the conversations that I'm hearing, or I wrote a young adult book about anxiety and computer games. And that was very much kind of picking up on like the conversation of the day. And then sometimes, so when I was writing I owe you one, I knew I wanted to get two people together and that they would exchange favors with each other. And I didn't know what the mechanism would be, but I thought this was really interesting and then kind of transactional love and how much, you know, is, is that a part of Sorry, it's gone out again. Oh, did you freeze? Okay, sorry, it's back. Yeah. I don't know what's going on if it's this. Well, we're a long way from each other, aren't we? Yes, I know, but still. <laughs> I don't know, it must be this corner of the house, which I've like never sat in before. Anyway, I apologize. Um, I just lost I, it at the very end. You know, I just got a thing saying your internet connection is unstable on mine. Oh, oh good, so it's your fault. It's my fault, yeah. Sorry. I feel much, I feel much better now. My zooming room, it should be okay. Oh, it's fine. There's probably lots of people zooming. It's fine, it always comes back. It's just like a couple seconds. You know, keeps me on my toes. <laughs> well, me too. So, shall I shall I go from like with I owe you one because I, I uh, just... yes, you didn't know about the mechanism. So I I didn't know what would be the mechanism to bring these two people about. And I'm sitting in a coffee shop, and this really happened. And and by the way, people are always saying to me, "Oh, I bet you pick up things from real life, don't you? I bet you just listen in on conversations and use them all." And I'm always like, I really wish that people would just act out a whole novel at the next table in the cafe, and I. <laughs> Like dictation, and I could write it all down. That would be handy. It's never happened yet. Anyway, the miracle happened. I'm sitting in this coffee shop, and this guy, and I have to say he was very handsome and American, which kind of added a bit of sparkle to the event. He looked at me, and he just went, um, oh, I have to step outside. Could you mind my laptop for a minute? I was like, this is it. This is how my characters meet. The, the, the coffee shop gods have given me my beginning. So that was absolutely you know, given to me as a gift. So as I say, each book is different. Um, and, and in this book, there's um, a very naughty dog who is the bone of contention between um, our lovely couple. And I was also in a similar way, I was sort of looking for a dog. I was thinking, I need, I need a dog. I want a really character of a dog. And I, I sort of met, you know, I have a dog and I met dogs, but they weren't quite. And then I stayed with some friends and I met this beagle and he was, such a character that I was like that's it okay you're going in my book <laughs> so you know you get inspiration all around that's great I love it and when did you know you wanted to write did you always know did you know from when you were a, a child or did it come later it it wasn't my childhood ambition you know I wasn't the child walking around saying oh I'm going to write a novel one day I, I love to read I mean I read obsessively and I read books over and over and over again which I Looking back, I think it kind of gives you a real sense of story, how stories work. If you practically know a book off by heart, you know, whether it's a classic or whether it's just, you know, a kind of run of the mill book, you know, knocking around your house. Um, so I loved stories and words, but I, 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 I didn't really even plan to write until I was in my 20s working as a journalist. You know, even at that stage, I thought, well, this is, you know, what I'm going to do. And it was really going on... Uh, the tube to work and reading every day in the days before we were all on our phones, you read books. So I read books the whole time. And I just had this cord of recognition, like, wait, you know, I know I'm writing financial articles and that's my job, but this is, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to make it up. I've never been any good at facts. I still am no good at facts. I'm far better. <laughs> it's all invented. Um, so I just started in my spare time, you know, I kind of sat on the train waiting till I got an idea. And the minute I started, I just felt like, yes, okay, now I feel at home. Um, and I was lucky enough to get that one published. And, you know, that's all I've done ever since. I'm fit for nothing else, except obviously bathing my children. I can do that too. <laughs> Yes, that's a, a, a skill we all somehow seem to magically acquire. <laughs> Not so much writing the Shopaholic series. <laughs> was, Shopaholic your, was that your first book, Shopaholic? Challenging. Um, in fact, I used to write before that under the name Madeline Wickham, which is actually oh, my... that's right. I knew that. I'm sorry. And yes. then I switched style, and the first one was Confessions of a Shopaholic. And that's where I really found comedy 
and realized how much I like writing comedy. So that felt like a new beginning. And it was kind of really exciting because it was just a new voice. Um, and it felt like I was starting my career all over again, uh, which is a great advantage that you have as a writer. You can kind of rebrand, you know, take a new name, start again, and it's kind of quite liberating. But is that, that is your actual name though, right? Sophie Kinsella? It's not, no. No, I not. No, I know. I've been Sophie for so long. And I answered. So, what, so what's your real name? Your Madeline. real name is Madeline? Oh, no way. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I should have somehow realized that. I no, 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 there's no way. No, it shows how good my disguise is. Um, no, I, I answer to Sophie now. I mean, I practically feel like Sophie because I live so much of my life as Sophie and all my, you know, my children know I'm Sophie. And so, um, and it's actually quite nice because. I can still, I'm, you know, I'm anonymous day to day. I go around my, you know, do my stuff. Nobody even twigs. Um, well, they sometimes twig, but you know, I, I feel quite under the radar, which is, you know, quite nice. And it's good for being a writer because you can eavesdrop in coffee shops as previously mentioned. Yes. And come up with all your ideas. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I did know that at some point and I forgot and I'm sorry. Anyway. I'm so sorry. Lost <laughs> in the midst of time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so do you always have your next thing? Like, do you know what your next book is already? Or are you just sort of going on? I always have a few things up my sleeve. And I find with an idea for a book, you need to give it a bit of time. So I'm working on something at the moment, which I've had like the shell kind of outline for a while. And, you know, I have all kinds of ideas. And you, I don't think you know instantly if it's going to have legs or if it's really a book or if, it, you know, is, is there enough to it? So I like to think ahead and have them in like different stages of development. And, and right now I'm at like, the nice stage where you're kind of fleshing out an idea and I think, yeah, this actually will work. So that's nice. It, the bad moment is when you think, yeah, that seemed like such a great idea in the cocktail bar. I was super excited and I wrote all these excited notes in lip liner because I didn't have a pen. And it makes no sense. It's gibberish. It's not a book. <laughs> so how far, how far down do you have to go? Like how many pages or how much time do you invest before you decide whether it's working or not? Oh, for me, I, I won't have written an awful lot. It's more like in the planning stages because I obsessively plan. So it's when I'm sketching out all my plan and the details. And I, have you frozen? Yeah, I lost you for a second. You said all my plan and the D details. It, you said it's only when I've sketched out all my plan and the details. I guess. I'm going to come in like a real pro here. Yeah. All my plan and the details and, and all of that, that, you know, that's when I know I've got a book and I won't, I won't start it unless I feel confident in that. I mean, I have friends who they just start, you know, they just start writing. And I am in such admiration of that. I would love to be that kind of free flow and uh, see where you go, let it grow. But I'm, I'm not that. I want to know that I have an ending, even if it's not the ending. Um, and I want to feel that there's a sort of solid plan for me to follow. So do you have it on index cards or do you just like write it out? How does it look? I have a big board with index cards, um, but... I always get kind of impatient with that because I can't put all the detail I would like on the index cards. So at some stage along the line, I then abandon that and that starts to look a bit sad and unloved and I start to write things on the computer and then I write them on bits of paper and then I have posters. I have like a million different systems. Then I start, my new thing is dictating into the phone, which is just great. So, you know, you, 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 you have a, a line of dialogue pops into your head and you just sort of randomly say it into your phone looking slightly deranged as you do so. Um, so. If you're walking through London ever and seeing someone in Trafalgar Square talking into her phone with a glazed expression, that's me. Um, but, you know, but then I forget what I've put where. So I have to do this kind of go round, like, okay, I had one idea on my phone and I had some other scene that I wrote on a, my laptop and try and, you know, put it all together into a book. <laughs> and I sometimes, you know, forget bits. A bit like when you, you know, you're doing a dinner party and you've got this thing, you, you know, you had this sauce and you had this side dish and, thing, and then you get to the end and you're collapsed and you open the oven and there's that bread you had heating the whole time and you forgot to serve it. 
<laughs> I said that for that. Love it. Um, yeah, just even your mentioning dinner parties makes me sad. I am missing that time of life when we could entertain and see friends and all the rest. <laughs> and it's so weird, isn't it? I just can't believe we're still here. I know. I kind of, I, I saw it as a summer thing. I kind of just felt, felt psychologically that the new new school year would begin and we'd all go, right, well, that was the summer. That was weird. And on we go. And so now, I don't know. I know. Very strange. So has it affected your like work or creativity or all that? I mean, it must, or maybe not. Well, yes. I mean, it was weird. And, and you know, during our kind of extreme lockdown, I was actually really glad. I mean, by absolute luck, I finished writing Love Your Life pretty much two days before lockdown when, wow. and then the whole, you know, family was, was here and we had to kind of do, as you say, the homeschool and all of it. Um, and so during lockdown, I edited it. And that's a really different process from writing. It's, you know, it's changing what you've already done. And I'm so glad because I think that against this sort of apocalyptic backdrop, I don't know how I would have written those final scenes. Whereas to edit them was fine. They, there they were. There's like, I could change them and I could amend and I could put myself, and I be, believe me, it was a wonderful escape for me to go back into that world. It was, um, it felt quite indulgent to kind of go back, especially writing the Italy bits. <laughs> it's like, I'm not here. I'm in a COVID free Italy right now, you know, and I'm on the beach and I'm in this amazing monastery and I'm in love and the food and it felt like a really lovely place to escape to um and then since then I suppose you know that kind of obsessive following of the news and every development I I, I have been unable to keep up with that I don't have the stamina to be following every development I just do what I'm told um you know try and follow the rules which are quite confusing I will say they keep changing um it's basically so I think sit on the sofa is about it <laughs> and and I'm sort of you know able I think now to, to to go into another world my brain isn't constantly being kind of drawn back into wait what pandemic you know which it was for a while but what I did actually during lockdown is I wrote um shopaholic lockdown diaries just as a little fun thing for my readers, because a lot of readers, you know, I'm, I'm in touch with them on social media and they would say, oh, you know, what would Becky do? And we had tremendous problems in the UK with like stockpiling and shopping and you couldn't get this and that. And I mean, shopping was like topic A for a while. Um, and I just couldn't resist it. And I thought, well, this might cheer everybody up. So I wrote what Becky was up to. And, you know, it was a tonic for me. And I, I hope it cheered up some people. You know, it was kind of... Um, you know, very of its moment, but it was kind of therapy as well for me. Yes, I have to go back and read those. I somehow missed that as well in my own sort of... Well, they, oh, it was very tiny. It was just like her diary of a, a few days and I put it uh, up on, on, you know, on the internet. I mean, it was just a sort of, you know, a gift really to my readers, like here's a, something to entertain you today. Is it on your Instagram or is it... No. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. In so story. Um, but, you know, that was, that was really nice. Oh. Um, because you've got to, you know, I'm someone who I just try and find something to laugh at, even in like the worst lockdown situation. Just, I mean, it took a while. I couldn't do it instantly. But there were, you know, after a few weeks, I was like, okay, come on, let's, you know, cheer the troops up here. Let's, let's find something to laugh about. <laughs> That's great. I mean, so needed, um, so necessary to find those outlets of not yeah. just like, you know. The end of the world mentality. So that's great. Thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> um, what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Oh, um, well, I'm someone who has has had to find their voice. Um, you know, I, I started with one kind of writing. I've changed into another kind of writing. I mean, it's sort of similar, but but quite different. And so I would say, you know, be true to what you want to write. Don't try and second guess write write what is right for you at the moment but be prepared to experiment because there might be different versions of you you know you may not hit on the right voice straight away um just so don't worry about that just keep trying i mean i, I i've written comedy now because i really enjoy it and i think that you can tell writers who love what they do whether it's crafting a, an excruciating thriller plot you know that's just so intricate or whether it's making people laugh or whether it's 
wonderful love scene. So write um, something that is going to light your fire because believe me, you're going to be with this book for a long time. It had better light your fire. Um, and, you know, if you really don't know where to begin, something I sometimes say is imagine that you go into a bookshop and you see the perfect book. You know, it's like a visualization. Imagine you walk in and you're like, that's the book I need to buy. You know, there are some books you walk in and it's a no brainer. Like I have to buy this. Of course I am going to read this. Well, whatever that is, whatever speaks to you, that's the book you need to write. It's, you know, that's the book that you would pick up. And if you would pick it up, then lots of other people would pick it up and it'll be different for everybody. It might be the plot. It might be the premise. It might be a character or a style. It, you know, it could be anything, but make it something really strong that is going to be still exciting in six months time when you're at chapter 10 yeah. and you hate the whole book and you forgot why you started and <laughs> you're thinking of giving up. You know, you need to have like that initial inspiration to come back to, to keep you going. Excellent advice. Love it. So is Shopaholic, is Becky going to make another appearance in a real book? Do you think, or you think not, or what's the plan? I have, um, Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I can never say goodbye to Becky. Um, the book I'm working on at the moment is not a Becky book, but she's always, she's always in my mind and in my heart. So um, I don't think we've said goodbye. But, um, you know, I never know when. And I'm someone who, you know, I have different ideas floating around, but then I always act on instinct, much like Ava. I go with like, I have to write this book right now. <laughs> so um, I can't always predict which one is kind of going to grab me. Um, but Becky's not going anywhere. Excellent. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you. Now I don't know what to call you. Madeline, I started calling you Sophie. Now I'll end this. Oh, oh, Sophie. I, I go weeks of my life at a time being Sophie. I feel like Sophie. It's my middle name. It is who I am, really. Okay. Um, so. okay. Well, whoever you are, thank you for coming on my podcast. Oh, and, it's been uh, such a great. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to say goodbye and release you to your kids, but maybe you could pretend. I know. I'm just going to carry on talking to the laptop. <laughs> 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 right that's a very long question yeah i better answer that <laughs> great length <laughs> oh, okay, i know we have to go this has been absolutely <laughs> chat. It's really you too it's been great <laughs> thank you for this comic interlude in my crazy day so thanks <laughs>